live. We are live. All right. Just a couple of seconds, see who joins us. And a lot of people watch this on Catch Up as well. Okay. As we're global, we do have a lot of people in Southeast Asia, in your area of the world. But uh -huh. joining me today, I'm very, very happy to have Stuart McDonald, who is the co-founder of Travel Fish. If you haven't heard of Travel Fish, get your phone out now and have a look at travelfish.org. And Southeast Asia is a hugely popular place for our members to visit, whether it be on a holiday or part of their round the world trip. So sure. this is just an incredible resource, isn't it? I referred to it yesterday as the Encyclopedia of Southeast Asia because it's something I used in 2011 <laughs> when we backpacked for eight months around Southeast Asia. And it's got itineraries and all the places to stay, places to eat. I mean, it's incredible. All sorts of unique itineraries as well, I'd say, more off the beaten track, which is why it works really well for this community. Yeah, yeah, we try and do a little bit more... Uh less mainstream stuff i guess we get we cover the main the top shelf stuff as well uh but yeah there's a lot more to see and do and what i love about what you do and this is what I, why i followed you for so long is your ethos and the way that you actually um have created the content because it's it's very labor intensive isn't it and unlike other travel guys you do it on foot and i'll just read out actually because i just screen grabbed what you say on the front page of your website it says founded in 2004 we've been researching independent travel guides to southeast asia ever since we pay our own way always and that's what i love because it's something yeah. that i do too never accept a freebie because mm. it just gives you that authenticity but tell us about how that came about and why you've you know created this resource with that philosophy that you will always pay your own way uh <clears throat> How do we fall into that? I mean, it's just it's just something I believe in. You know, I don't come from a a PR background or or a business background. And my my wife and myself we're both reformed backpackers. You know, um, and it just didn't feel right to me. And I mean, there've been past experiences where I I had used material and then found out later that it had been comped or or whatever. And like this is pre pre travel fish, and that didn't really sit well with me. Um, and so we just decided to do it this way instead. You know, um, if they don't know you're coming, then you should get the same experience as any other person who walks in. So you're not showing up, sort of saying, "I'm la di da, writing for the New York Times. Can I have the suite, please?" Yeah, no like, blogs. Give me the room next to the, you know, the between the the metalworking workshop and the <laughs> and whatever, you know. Um, I mean, I'm in a hotel at the moment. Uh, I'm treating my son. He's a very keen um, plane watcher, so we've taken a hotel right beside the airport. So he's on the roof at the moment watching the plane. You're in Bali, aren't you? Yes, in Bali. Yeah, and. Um, I tell you what, this hotel is very ordinary, um, but I don't think that if I'd showed up asking for a freebie, I would have got anything better. I think they're all pretty ordinary here at the moment. Um, but, yeah, no, it was just how we decided to do it. And and I know that uh, within uh, traditional publishing, we're uh, in the minority, and I understand why a lot of writers uh, do choose to um take complimentary stays or media rates or whatever um we just decided not to do it and i mean obviously there's a, a serious financial impact in taking that approach and um i mean uh, compared to when we started i mean i'll pay more than i would used to like i stay in a better standard of place perhaps than i did when i was 25. um but there's always been places that we just can't afford to pay our own way to stay at, so we don't cover them, you know? Yeah. And and I think that's just, that's fine. I'm not trying to pretend to be a horizon pool, luxury resort, whatever person, because, I mean, I'll take a luxury resort if, if I have to, but, I mean, it's not really somewhere I would normally choose to, to seek out. Um, yeah. So we pay our way, uh, we pay the writer's expenses and that kind of stuff, so that's all covered. Um, and so it just gives us a little bit better 
or perhaps um, perceived independence and and that kind of thing. I think that's quite important. Yeah, and I think what's what's so great about it is, like you say, it's like what what you experience is exactly what the reader would experience if they turned up at this, you know, local B and B or homestay. So it really is a true representation of what you're going to experience. Um, as the visitor, isn't it? And what I also love is you find the little places that aren't necessarily in any guidebooks anyway or online, because they might be just local families who can't afford to sort of cut their, you know, money for it with other big um, places like booking.com or any of the big websites. So you do uncover the really unique places as well, which is what I like, the real, the small local family owned places. Yeah, thanks. I, I mean, like w from when we first started, we we have tried, not always successfully, but we've tried to um, highlight locally owned, family owned businesses, that kind of thing, um, because I'm a strong believer, <clears throat> excuse me, in the in the value of independent travel and putting money into locals' hands. You know, uh, so when you're staying at some chain hotel or a fancy resort or or whatever. Um, I mean, yeah, maybe locals are getting jobs there, like making up rooms or serving serving in the restaurant or something like that. But that, that's not the same, I don't think, as when you're in like a homestay kind of situation or or something like that, where it's family owned, where you're sitting there in in the morning on a weekday, <clears throat> and mum and dad are there shuttling the kids off to go to school, yeah. you know. And if you stay there long enough, you get to know the kids, you get to know the families, you know. Yeah. And I think this, is, this is that whole, there is so much of travel, like in the industry is fixated on the transactional stuff, like how, where, where's the money going and that kind of thing. But there's a lot more to travel than that. And it's it's like the, it's an interchange of, of getting to know different people. They get to know me, more about me, I get to know more about them. It's fostering greater understanding sometimes. Um, and I think that's sort of a, a whole side of travel that just doesn't really hit the radar when yeah. you're talking about the, the business side of things. You know, it's mm -hmm. a lot more than just paying for your room. Absolutely. And I, someone asked me the other day, because I love, you know, budget travel, I suppose, sort of the lower end of the market, someone said, what is budget travel to you? And I said, actually, it's more value driven travel for me I get value out of finding the local places and getting to know the local people and I love staying in a homestay when they've only got two or three rooms because like you mm. say you're sitting there where you're eating with them and you know you're finding out about their family life and actually find out more about the local area and then the places to eat and all those other um, places to see which are far nicer much more enriching experience yeah, I mean for sure. I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying you can't have that happen at a fancy place as well. You know, I mean, uh, my wife certainly prefers to stay in a fancier style of accommodation than I'm. I'm happy in, but I mean, <laughs> you, you, you get a, a you get a good concierge, and they'll say, "Oh, yeah, this is where you should go," and they they can read you. You know, they know what you want, and that's what a good concierge is. But I. I don't think you have to stay at a fancy place to to um to achieve that. I mean, uh, we just had Nepi here the the day of silence in Bali, so we went up to to Ahmed in the northeast and uh, stayed in a, a beautiful beautiful place, and it's ideal for families because it's uh, we had, I had two kids and the the compound was three wooden uh, like Javanese style houses. And um, so we each had our own, so which is perfect. <laughs> and, and there's a pool and the ocean and all of that. And uh, I, I don't know what it would be in euros, but in in um, it was uh, one million two hundred thousand rupiah, so about like under a hundred dollars US a night, which for me is still quite a bit, but for a family, that's not such a bad deal, you know. Nice. And so. I, I'm happy to go and have a like. I would definitely consider that a splurge. Um, when I travel by myself, I'd normally be paying like twenty, thirty bucks a night. Something like that is sort of my comfort yeah. mark. But but I'll often spend a bit more. But anything into three figures, and yeah, it's, it's got to be pretty good or pretty special. 
And um, yeah, I mean, over the years, I mean, I've been traveling around in Southeast Asia since uh, since 93 and um, in circles. And so over that time, uh, I found like you find the, the places that stick around, you know, and often um, you have like a really lovely, tasteful, foreign run kind of place. But then there'll also be somewhere that's locally run, you know, by people who were born in that town. And when the, when those two places are at the same standard, then for me, I would always stay or angle towards the locally owned. Mm. Um, but once you've been going through these towns enough times over the years, you see what lasts. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, fine. Actually, some- We'll talk about that later, actually, because we think we were having a quick chat, actually, because of COVID, it's impacted so many of these local businesses, hasn't it? And that's something Mm -hmm. uh, we'll come on to a bit later. But you do tend to go a little bit more off the beaten track sometimes. So how do you plan your trips when you're, I mean, obviously, pre-COVID and you'll be doing this post-COVID? How do you go about it? Because you don't like to plan everything anyway, do you? No, not really. Um, I, it depends on the trip, where, uh, whether I'm doing a capital city or like a whole bunch of towns or whatever, like pre-COVID, I would be away two to three weeks a month on average. Um, and I travel by myself almost always. Um, so if it was a bunch of towns, I start with a paper map and a notebook. So I still do most, I do like my photos and, uh, you know, latitudes and longitudes and everything. They're all in the phone, but the main stuff is I still handwrite it. Um, so I start off with a hit list of, okay, I think I need three days here, two days there, three days here, six days there, two hours there, you know, like that kind of thing. Yeah. And um, I do a lot of two-hour towns. <laughs> I, I say that everywhere is worth a night, but uh, to be honest, I don't know that that's really true. Oh, um, so how do you say it? S- S- new- Sahun so oh, in Cambodia, Sanukville, or whatever you call it. I was oh, Sanukville. Oh my god, yeah, it's yes. horrible, isn't it? It's changed yeah. so much. <laughs> I, I was, I was never like a great Sanukville fanboy, to be honest. Like, we lived in Phnom Penh uh, quite a long time ago and used to go down to Sanukville, and I've never been much of a fan. But when I went back, it was like, oh my god, you know, oh. it, it was hell's bells. Uh, but like as we were up, we, we were writing about the islands offshore, or I was, and and we just sort of said, "Well, you've got to go through hell to get to heaven," you know. And <laughs> that's, that's what it was like. Um, and I remember I, I I talked to a hotelier while I was there, and um, I'm like, "What are you doing? Like, why do you why do you still have this business?" And they said, well, you know, like they had lived there for a long time. They weren't from Sierra McBill, they were Khmer. And they said, some people get stuck here uh, and they want to stay and everything, uh, but there's not really anywhere else we want to go, you know? And they really? don't know how to do anything else. Well, no, they're, they're Khmer. So oh, yeah. it, it was kind of interesting. I felt really sorry for them because it was the place was fine. Like it wasn't the best thing since sliced bread, but there was nothing really wrong with it other than it was in Seelookville, you know. Yeah. And, um, so, yeah, sometimes it's a bit hard when you say to people, well, just don't go to that town. Mm. Uh, that does have a repercussion. Like I'm not super influential, I'm not Lonely Planet or whatever, but, I mean, it's it still has a repercussion for the, the people who are trying to get by there. Because back in 2011, Otras Beach, I absolutely loved because it had that yeah. really lovely vibe. But um, I think I recommended it probably four years ago to someone in the group and it had just started to turn. And right. it's, it's not the same anymore. And it's just such a shame. <laughs> so I was really upset because I loved that beach. It had everything I loved about the, you know, really laid back and the beach huts yeah. right in front and the swings and everything. And yeah. no longer there. Well, it, it still has a few, there's a few little spots like that still on Otras, or there were, was last year anyway, or year before, sorry. Um, but most of it is a complete disaster area. You know, I mean, there's no other way to describe it. You know, it was, I, I really, I just couldn't believe it. Yeah. Like I'd seen the photos, I'd seen the movie, the videos and stuff, 
and people had told me about it and it had been quite a few years between my visits so it was it wasn't it wasn't a boiling frog it was more like a frog being tossed off a building or something and and um yeah it was just i it took my breath away i couldn't believe it you know so I sort of interjected in your conversation about how you plan your trip. So yeah, some towns you oh, go in yeah. two hours, and um, yeah. but you find places as you go, don't you? So the new places that might not have existed last time you visited. Yeah, I I find new places a lot of different ways. I, I know quite a few people in the region. Uh, I know uh, a lot of other travel writers and that kind of stuff. And so I'll tap them up for information and tips. Like there's always a lot of back scratching and in, in that kind of thing. Um, I'll talk to hoteliers where, where I am, you know, like I'm going to to wherever, to, to Kwandan next week, where should I stay? What's a good place to eat? You know, that, that kind of thing. And just file it all the way. Um, and yeah, I just sort of shake it out, you know, and not everything makes the cut. Uh, obviously, um, and I eat a lot, um, <laughs> but I don't eat everything, and that, that's the thing, you know, like when you're having six or eight meals a day, you can't, well, you could, but you'd be the size of a horse, but I mean, um, you have to just eat a little bit, like is it good or whatever, and then it's always with the staff, it's like, well, what's wrong with it? And it's like, well, oh, no, yes. I'm just, I've just, got to eat six more bowls today, you know? Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, and then at the end of the day, it's um, just a mass of business cards and napkins and notebooks and, and whatever, and that goes onto the laptop and then start again the next day. Um, but it really depends. Um, some places take a lot more time and require a lot more planning. Mm -hmm. um, if you Because I'm trying to turn around things because I have this fairly tight window before I need to get back to the family um to try and get my bang for my buck and so yeah it's a, a good friend of mine celeste brash she's a lonely planet writer and she she the way she described it i thought was really good she said um travel writers see everything and experience nothing <laughs> yes. and, and i think that it's a bit bleak but there's also a lot of truth to that you know? yeah um, yeah. Sorry, my dog is scraping at the door. That's so typical. No. I thought he let me just open the door so that he doesn't go. Oh. To sleep. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Come on, then, silly dog. So sorry about that. That's live for you, isn't it? Got the yeah. dog jumping at me. <laughs> no. No I'm waiting for my one my son to surface. He's up on the roof somewhere watching. Oh me. yeah, my son's upstairs. I think I'm running past his PJs in a minute or something. <laughs> you must have <laughs> hundreds of notebooks now. Hundreds of them. Do you keep them? Yeah, yeah. I've still got the very wow. first one I used in Vietnam in uh, 1993. <gasps> so, oh, my goodness. Yeah, I kept everything, unfortunately. Wow. Much to my wife's uh, displeasure. <laughs> <laughs> well, this leads me on because it's such a unique concept, the way that you do everything. It's not traditional in the sense that you don't charge people to be on your website. Everything is yeah. independently reviewed. So generating revenue, revenue is quite a challenge. I remember reading back years ago, actually, loads of interviews mm. about, you know, it's hard to monetize something if you're keeping. So, um, you know, you want to do things in a certain way. So you mm. have a really good membership scheme, don't you, on your website, yeah. which you yeah. can subscribe to for 95 and it's Aussie dollars, isn't it, for a lifetime? Yeah. For, yeah. Um, what we used to make money lots of different ways, like hotel bookings and as and whatever. And then we switched to a membership program a few years ago, which was uh, 35 Australian dollars per year. And then about a year ago, it was when I did the reason design, so it was a little bit longer, um, I added this thing that was $95 forever because I thought, well, you know, why not? Why not like, just try it, you know? And because some people do like come here and then they, come back to the region in four years time or or whatever and yeah. I, I don't really feel fair sort of charging 35 bucks a year when they're in peru or something you know so we thought well 95 bucks is a nice round number and we'll throw cows fish in and that kind of thing and um and that's what most people do now it's been quite surprising um yeah. and um and i think also because of 
COVID and the lockdowns and that the really, like, you can't really travel very much. It, it sort of felt a bit weird. Like, I need the money, but, I mean, like, I, it felt a bit weird charging people for information uh, that they weren't really to act on. And obviously we're not yeah. updating at the moment because of uh, because of COVID. So tell us what you get for that because you've your itineraries. I mean, like you, you've got sample ones on your website anyway, haven't you? I mean, they're like mm -hmm. seventy pages long, sixty pages long. They're really in depth, they're like yeah. books. But you have access yeah. to those, don't you? Yeah. So a, a paid member gets um, all the PDF guides. So that's like a like a mini. It's it's basically like the section of of the website for a particular town. So for whatever Chiang Mai or something. And so it's all of the everything thrown into a single PDF. So we have about, they get about 300 of those, I think it is. They're the destinations that we've cooked into, into PDFs. And then they, uh, some sections of the website are um, paywalled, so they need to, need to be a member to be able to access that. And they get the forum, and then the, if it's a lifetime member, they get um, the catfish if they want it. Um, and that's about it. Oh, the other thing is I do, um, or I used to do, uh, consulting. So like, uh, trip planning services kind of thing where I don't do very much of that anymore, but, um, uh, but so that we dropped the rate half price for that. So, um, but that's about it, you know, um, there's a forum and that kind of thing, but a lot of the travel chit chat have moved to Facebook and Twitter and and that kind of thing so that's a pretty quiet part of the site yeah but um, amazing value just for those guides isn't it it's great especially 95 well, for a lifetime we've got loads of members who live in southeast asia you see so we've if you're right. based there it's great value just to um you know sign up and then have all those guides there at, you know at your fingertips yeah that, that's true and i mean um i mean they don't have to sign up forever i mean they're welcome to but they can also <laughs> sign up for um for thirty-five dollars, and there is a shorter one as well. It's like, what is it? It's two weeks, I think. I can't remember. There, there is another cheaper one as well for somebody who just wants to. Oh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what this travel fish thing is, and I want to <laughs> out. Um, so they can do that, but nobody does. So um, I don't know. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Mm. So you were talking about COVID because you've. You have reviewed, I think, well, the latest stat on your website was over 8,000, but it's probably more than that, isn't it? Accom like accommodation outlets that you've been to, well, you and in a few of your team have visited. In, in the region, yeah. It's, it'd be, uh, oh, property wise, yeah, it's about 8,000. And that's, it's, um, that's over like a prolonged period of time, but I mean, some of them we've revisited too many times. Um, what percentage of those then, have you? Big pardon? What percentage of those eight thousand have you actually visited? I would say I've seen, I've, I've inspected, probably hotel wise, somewhere between three and four thousand in wow. Southeast Asia. Um, it, Not legwork. Like work. I don't, I don't um, tattoo each one on my arm or anything like that. You know, so. <laughs> Um, but we've also had like it, it isn't just my work, and I, I like to just be clear about that. I mean, we we have had on and off like um, a team of writers working for us and doing some extremely good work. So it's not mm. it's not just me walking around looking at hotels. Um, but in the same vein as you've done it, they don't they don't announce themselves. They turn up exactly the same way, don't they? And yeah. so yeah, absolutely, yeah. So talk about let's talk about COVID and how that has obviously impacted the travel industry hugely, massively yep. impacted your business. And yep. um, we were talking off camera before, and, and I mentioned it earlier that the big challenge is, isn't it? A lot of these businesses ha aren't going to survive this period. And you living in Bali, and I read on your um, newsletter that came out this morning that you're talking about um, you visited places that. Um, have closed down and how many of these places are going to survive this period so there's a huge challenge you know on ground isn't there for mm. survival um, yeah. how's this impacting you well i mean i think there's two sides to it uh from from me personally for my business i mean it destroyed it like completely 
uh, from from a revenue point of view, mm. like it, it just. Sorry. Sorry. That's okay. Okay, Doc. Sorry. It's a tiny fluffy dog, but he likes to have a big voice. That's, that's all right. No, normally, when I record, I have a rooster, so um, <laughs> I'm used to it. Um, yeah, no, I mean, COVID destroyed our business uh, entirely. Um, and so out of, that was one of the reasons why I decided to, to start Cowfish. But um, on the ground, I mean, it's a, it's a bloodbath, you know. Um, earlier in the year here in Bali, hotel occupancies were about 3%. Um, and, I mean, tourism has dropped to, to almost nothing. But, I mean, domestic tourism has always been a, a, a major part of the scene here, but it, it, it is looked after by a different part of the industry, you know. Mm -hmm. It, you do have hotels that have mixed clientele and everything, but often More it's sure, it? quite separate. Um, but, yeah, it's been brutal and there hasn't been, like, the uh, governmental financial support that some countries have seen. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's been terrible. Um, I mean, not just in Thailand. I mean, I was reading a story this morning in, about the industry in, Tha in Thailand. Sorry. <clears throat> that was talking about how the suicide rate had gone right through the roof. And, you know, people are... Because in 2019, all the... 2019? That's, yeah, 2019, all the talk was over tourism. You know, people were, like, leveraging themselves to the eyeballs to cater to this insatiable tourism beast. And then everyone stayed home, you know. So you've got people who have borrowed money... Uh, who built villas and hotels and guest houses and whatever, and they've got no means whatsoever to to pay this money back. Um, so yeah, it's been uh, like like everyone thought in 2019 tourism was too high, but I don't think anyone was wishing for for this uh, this kind of extreme result. Oh, no. um, so yeah, it's it's been ex extremely difficult. I mean, we're very lucky. I mean, we're we're still financially okay because of other other pr projects and stuff. Um, but for a lot of others, I mean, in Ahmed, I would say probably three quarters of the businesses were closed. Oh. So how many of those are um, closed just because they're waiting for a booking, and then when a booking comes in, they'll open? how many are closed until COVID's gone, how many have just, like, some of them were clearly abandoned. Um, and it's like there's a story of misery behind every single one of those. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's um, terrible. It's awful. I think we, we probably not, you know, we talk about tourism opening up again, but actually we're not thinking about what's going to be left when it does open up and the impact it's actually had on those those individuals and those smaller businesses. It's not just a matter of being able to open up because a lot of these people just haven't been able to survive at all. And, yeah, I think there's going to be... Uh, it's going to be really devastating the next six or seven months. Well, yeah, I think and the rest. And I've been a, a bit of a minority voice in some of this reopening discussions because I... I think I believe very strongly that um, the the health of the people in in the destination is is a paramount important. So I think it should be safe for for the locals before um, a, a tourism is brought back in. And mm -hmm. not everybody agrees with this point of view. Um, and I haven't always been particularly eloquent in how I've um, explained how I feel about this. But anyway, um, I mean, in Thailand, vaccinations have barely started. Uh, at the current rate in Indonesia, it's going to take them 10 years. Um, so when you start, if you, if you decide, okay, we're going to vaccinate the population before we're going to bring tourism back in, uh, you're looking at years. Wow. Um, so, but, but then the minister here, one of the ministers, uh, was saying that he thinks Bali should be open June this year. And then the health minister said he thinks it should be open April next year. I saw that. So, yeah. I mean, 
if you're a business owner, what are you supposed to do with that information? It's you know, there are parts in it. I mean, it just seems crazy. Yeah, like it's, it's just a, a crapshoot, and um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a tricky, tricky situation. It's you boil it down. It's it's a balancing act between public health and businesses making money and and employment and people mm -hmm. being able to put food on the table. And I get that that's not always a very uh, simple uh, calculus. Um, but I mean, here, like the COVID situation is pretty bad. And, um, but I mean, other, other parts of Southeast Asia have, have weathered it better. But I mean, Vietnam's not looking at opening up anytime soon. Um, so yeah, it's very much a, a waiting game. Yeah. Well, we'll end, we'll end on a slightly more positive note. All right. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about the let's talk about the future when we when hopefully it, uh, when things brighten up where yeah. are the places that you would love to revisit particularly from a family perspective because obviously you travel a lot with your family as well when you can yeah. so where would you recommend um more off the beaten track really off the beaten track uh, well a couple of places i can indonesia is um where i spent a lot of my time um, but where I just was in Ahmed, I can give you the links and stuff for, for oh, this. Oh, awesome. Thank well. you. Um, it's a place called the Kampung in, in, um, on Bunutan Beach in, in Ahmed. And it's the, the traditional Javanese houses. You get your own pool, your own kitchen. There's a living area. It was just superb. We've already booked a return stay, oh, um, nice. which is in July. Um, also in Indonesia, in very far flung uh, in the east, there's an island called Alor, and off the coast of that, there is a smaller island called Kepa, and on that, there is a tiny, well, it's, it calls itself a dive resort, but you don't have to be diving. It's a French rum place. It's been there 20 years. Oh, awesome. And it's called Le Petit Kepa, and we... I was supposed to go there for my 50th last year, but then had to cancel it because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And um, there we, we rent this wooden house. It's right on the cliff. The cliff drops down, the beach is there, the waters go out, there's sharks, baby sharks in the water on the reef. And oh, then there's a perfectly volcanic shaped other island right in front. And oh, it's got beautiful. perfect Wi-Fi and I, I just, I, it's, I love it, you know, and they're a really interesting couple and they've been hooked into uh, the local community there forever and a day, like their heart is really in the right spot. So I'm really, really big fan of that. Oh, that sounds amazing. Um, yeah, it's a good spot. And it's, I mean, it works out full board for a family of four was about a hundred bucks a night. Oh, amazing. Full board. Yeah. That's incredible. Uh, not beer, but everything else, you know. <laughs> uh, so that, that wasn't that wasn't too bad. But outside outside of Indonesia, uh, with the family, I just did last – no, not last year, the year before. My God, where's the time go? I know. It's crazy, isn't it? We're in 2021 now. Ah. Oh, I know. <laughs> I, I took the kids up to southwest Thailand uh, for about three weeks. And we started in Trung and we island hopped all the way down the, the southwest coast, just like each each island was like three or four days kind of thing. Oh, wow. And that was just great, you know, and the kids loved it. And because like here it's all surf, but there it's it's not, you know. And my kids can they can swim fine, but um I could just let them go and they they'd go and do whatever and and they loved it. And it was that was really really. I think Thailand is just so easy. You oh, know? it's really easy, it's isn't it? So easy. The food is extraordinary. The people are fantastic, and it's still in the scheme of things quite affordable. So, yeah. You know, those Southwest Islands were. Yeah, I'd definitely go back and do that. I think that's on your website. Yeah. Is that on your website? Yeah, that one? It's, yeah. I've been covering that on Couchfish. Yeah. Um, that's like part of the free series. Um, only a couple more entries to go, and I'm finally done with that and start writing about something else. Um, Amazing. But I mean, the couchfish thing has been interesting because I started that at the beginning of of COVID, 
And the idea was I want to bring travel, I want to bring the region to people, right? So that's why we came up with the name. Because every at the time when I started, it was the really strict lockdowns, you know, like everyone's yeah, stuck no, anywhere. Anyway. You know, and so okay, I'll bring travel to you on your couch. And um, initially, it was like this kooky kind of itinerary that I had sort of planned out. And and now I'm up to like day 220 or, or, or something, I, I don't know. Um, and when I, when I went to start it, my wife was like, no one's going to want that. Who wants that, you know? But it turned out that it's been, I mean, it's not hugely successful, but I mean, it's, it's worth doing. And... Um, but what has really made it worth doing is the number of messages I get from people who, is, who oh, say, like, um, I get all these crappy emails day in, day out, but I always look forward to this one. And and that's just like, that's why I did it, you know, like to sort of say Southeast Asia will still be here. Whenever this this disaster finally dissipates and goes away, the region will still be here. The food will still be here. The people will still be here. The culture will still be here. It's not going anywhere. Um, and so it was really... It's storytelling, isn't it? Like your, your character. Yeah. It's storytelling, isn't it? It's really, yeah. Like, yeah, it's really nice. And you also have it recorded so you can listen to it as a podcast, which is really That's handy. Right. Yeah. My mother has decided, uh, discovered a lot of stuff from my early travel that I think she would have preferred not to. <laughs> <laughs> it's been hidden in those notebooks all this time <laughs> yeah yeah exactly well it's been very useful having those notebooks now because i mean some of the some of the stuff i'm writing about happened like 20 years ago um but they've been very memorable experiences um but the notebooks have been yeah very helpful in job memories and that kind i'm of impressed stuff. with that in fact you still got more well, thank you so much for talking with me today. And I, oh, my you, pleasure. anyone watching, please go on to travelfish.org because once you're in there, it is like a rabbit warren of uh, Southeast Asia. You can't get out. <laughs> just too yeah. many things to look at. <laughs> yeah, it's like a treasure trove, isn't it? So yeah. thank you for joining me here today. And That's if anyone has any questions, please post them and I can pass them on. And, and I'll put the links that you've recommended as well. Yeah. Um, I'll put them over to Cool. Well, have a lovely day. Yeah, you too. All right. Thank you, everyone.